so uh, my name is Ostap Kushnir. Uh, I am assistant professor at Lazowski University in Warsaw, Poland, and I'm affiliated to the Department of Government Studies here at, at Lazowski University. So my fields of interest uh, are geopolitics, post-communist and post-Soviet transition, democratization in post-communist and post-Soviet states, um, Eastern European and Central European politics, European neighborhood politics. The book is an attempt to assess Ukraine, the geopolitical potential of Ukraine, um, and the geopolitical tools Russia uses in its foreign, contemporary foreign policy from the perspective of political symbolism and collective memory. So I took, I referred to the findings of uh, Professor Eric Wogelin, who developed uh, the, the concept of political symbolism. And he arrived at the point that actually the development of a nation, of a group of people, of ethnicity, is deeply rooted in how they see uh, the justice and order. So all they do to self-govern themselves are simply the attempt to discover what works best for this group of people and living within certain territory. So, and he says that at the very end, this group of people reintroduced, he arrived to the point that at the very end, this group of people reintroduces year by year, decade by decade, the same patterns of governance, uh, which they define as the best for them, as the best suited for this particular territory. And, uh, you know, if to compare, for instance, we may look at the state, yes, any state, as a work of art. But the governance of that state is like a motif in art. So it's simply something that reinstalls itself in a different shape. Yes, because again, speaking of art, we may say that, you know, Asian Greeks were making some statues, then the Renaissance, the, the, you know, these artists were making this status, but you, you see the same, actually, similar shapes, yes, or ideas, but, you know, they were performed differently because of differences in, in different eras and, and different trends. That's the same with, with the state. So, for instance, if the two-party system works best for the United States, you know, it will simply be reintroduced, reinstalled with no other solution becoming very you know, challenging and you know, becoming able to replace that system. If, for instance, you speak of, of, the, of the UK, you have laborers, you have conservatives. Yes? And yes, you have right now um, liberal Democrats, but they are not that influential. If you look at, at Russia and try applying that political symbolism to Russia, you may discover that Russia, the best way to govern over Russia is to have a strong leader at the very top. So I was applying that political symbolism to Russia and to Ukraine and through discovering what is the best way, what are the symbols, or the, what is the best way to, to, to govern all the state and what are the symbols uh, which people adjust themselves to while thinking of justice and order. So through discovering this, you know, specific constructs, symbolic constructs for Russia and for Ukraine, I simply drew a comparison. And therefore Ukraine and Russian neo-imperialism, the divergent break, because what I discovered was that Ukraine re is indeed a divergent from the Russian way of governing, Russian vision of, of justice and order. That was if to speak of political symbols. Then also I referred to uh, Maurice Holbrook's collective memory. That is the historical experiences encoded in, uh, um, in the memory of every individual, uh, bearing in mind that the memory of every individual is shaped by certain social narr narratives. So it means that individuals are encouraged to forget or are always uh, reminded about certain events. Therefore, collective memory is something 
that everyone knows within a certain group of people because this is something that is you know appropriate to know in this or that society. Um, based on that fact, I also examined the historical development of uh, Russia and pointed on the key achievements or key ideas which are always reiterated in the public discourse today in Russia. And also I examined the historical experience in Ukraine uh, and tried to point out which are the ideas re-emerging today and what kind of experience is lacking in that collective memory. Because if you look, for instance, at the statehood experience of Ukrainians, this is the missing bit. Because throughout history, um, there were several attempts to create a sovereign independent state, but it all, all of them ended in some kind of semi-sovereign entities, unfortunately. And, and that experience specifically, the interwar experience, because you had uh, the First World War, then you know the Woodrow Wilson uh, a, a approaches and policies, uh, the recognition of all the European states, um, the right for self-identification of the smaller European states, and that was the point where Baltic states emerged as sovereign entities. Poland uh, re-emerged on the map, Czech, Czechoslovakia, but the, Ukraine was not wasn't on the list. So. The interwar experience, the lack of the interwar uh, statehood experience, this is the missing bit of collective memory, uh, in collective memory of Ukrainians, which also predefines um, the current day transformation, democratization and post post uh, Soviet transformation. So, coming back to Russia and political symbolism, I have discovered that the vision which Russians have. Uh, regardless the justice board order, they orbit around three symbolic constructs, three pillars. The pillar is the leadership, second orthodoxy and third Russianness. This has a lot to do with Minister Uvarov's uh, statement uh, about um, what is what is the proper, because Minister Ovaro was the Minister for Education in Imperial Russia. In 1883, he uh, issued some guidelines for all educational institutions, how to teach new generation of, our, of Russians. And he said that there are three, you know, dogmas which should never be challenged. The autocracy, orthodoxy and the Russianness. And that was officially recorded in 1883. So it, it, I, I assume that it had emerged earlier than 1883. In 1883 it was officially you know, postulated, recorded, presented. And since that time, uh, I argue that since that time uh, all the political transformations taking place in Russia or the foreign and domestic policies which Russia pursues can be explained through uh, assessment how these three pillars work. So true leadership, it means that there should be always a leader on the top. Either he is or she is emperor or empress, a general secretary of communist party, president, tsar, anyone. So there should be a strong man, a strong woman, who builds up his or her hierarchy of governance and that hierarchy penetrates the whole state. And it also means that uh, the strong man and strong woman stands above the law. So even if an action is needed to be taken, yes, these governing um, authorities can act regardless of the law. And they are needed to introduce that justice and order, justice which is not that deeply rooted into law and order because it is, you know, people expect someone to be on the top. Then we have uh, the concept of orthodoxy. Orthodox Church, because of all the reforms uh, it, it underwent in the history of Russia, is deeply interrelated with that pillar of leadership. Uh, for, from my perspective and from what I discovered, 
orthodoxy is the way to justify the decisions of the leader or, and the way to reinforce the governing hierarchy with the leader. So as, uh, as the church, as Orthodox Church, Russian Orthodox Church, um, allows or encourages citizens of Russian Federation and all Orthodox Christians to, to follow, to, to practice religion. Yes. But as just certain um, messages emerge in the social and political uh, discourse in Russia, and these messages are generated by political authorities, Russian Orthodox Church starts to reinforce these messages, justify these messages, explain these messages, and provide some moral justification for these messages, even if these messages are not um, legal. For instance, uh, Crimean annexation or the war in Donbass. From the perspective of international law, these are very, very dubious actions. But political leadership of Russian Federation decided to proceed, while the Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church uh, explained that, that it's natural, because we are fighting the so-called Russian world, or we are defending those who are in need. So they connected political interests, political objectives, or geopolitical objectives, to some kind of Christian values. And you have the third pillar. The third pillar is the pillar of Russianness. This is the set of features which you know every citizen of Russian Federation should possess to feel him or herself comfortable. Um, Professor Ledinova, Aluna Ledinova, he introduced she introduced the term sistema. So this is um, something unwritten set set of set of uncodified uh, behavioral principles, um, which are familiar to, to, to citizens of Russian Federation. So, in order to achieve what you want to achieve, you are not obliged to follow law and you know introduce or adjust to the legal principles, but you may use the interpersonal connections to achieve what you would like to have. Uh, also, Russianness entails that uh, Russian citizens they prefer um, community thinking. They are not trying to identify themselves as individuals, unlike, for instance, Western citizens of Western states who who enjoy individual freedoms, liberties, and you know who are who agree to to take some duties and responsibilities as an individual. In Russian way of thinking, Russian vision of justice and order, individual is not that important. What matters is the community. So within community, those who are very successful, they become obliged to take care who are not that successful. And it means that we have certain, you know, equalization, equalizing, that if you are doing quite good, if you're a successful businessman, okay, you we are happy with that, but please take care or think about those who are not that successful. And because you have that com community thinking, um, Russian society is comparatively traditionalist, and Russian society agrees to follow one leader because having one leader who can manage community is the best way of governance for such a huge country as Russian Federation is or, you know, Soviet Union, which was even bigger than Russian Federation today. This works. This works in the conditions of Russian Federation, which emerged and continues to exist as an empire. Empire built by the strong men, strong women, without the consent of people, with, not with the consent of, of people, but uh, without the necessity to, to get their feedback. And this is what, what differ, this is the key difference between, for instance, Russian Federation and the Western states. Because the Western states, you have majority, majority of Western states. You have the governing institutions created from the bottom. So people decided how to self-govern themselves or what 
instruments of governance to implement, so that this government governance becomes the most efficient uh, within the territory. In Russian Federation, this is vice versa. This is from top to the bottom. If you look in Ukraine, from the perspective of uh, political symbolism and collective memory, we have a very interesting paradox, because Russia can be centralized, and actually it should be centralized. It should have that central governance and strong men and strong women at the very top. Otherwise, um, a series of unrests will, will emerge in Russia. In Ukraine, the condition of decentralization, the condition of uh, struggle for power uh, between different actors, this is a natural modus operandi. Actually, if you look at, at Kyiv and Rus, at Kyiv Rus, in the Middle Ages, or even earlier, or later, you may see that, for, but let us stick to the Ubers. You may, def, you may see that there were a lot of city-states ruled by princes. And sometimes, um, quite often actually, the city-states had their dialects or languages. They had their identity. They had their feeling of belonging. They had their population who identified themselves with these city-states. And in the times danger, when, for instance, the Mongol invasion started, instead of unifying all the resources which Kyivrus possessed, yes, and that would actually allow Kyivrus to, to withstand that attack, princes preferred to meet hordes of Mongols face to face alone. And that led eventually to the defeat of the whole, whole system. So later we have Cossack times and uh, the Prussian siege. And we also have that vision of decentralization. So if a person was trusted on the Prussian siege among, among Cossacks, this person could be a leader. This person inspired others and could naturally govern over the rest. And the democratic Cossack tradition also presumed that there were a lot of poles of power in the Prussian siege and within uh, Cossack hetmanate as it emerged after 1649, with uh, numerous hetmans, numerous um, other actors, power holders, competing with one another for more power. So, and if you look, for instance, into the history, you have uh, Hetman Vehovsky, who allied with Tatars and fought Muscovites. And, and at the same time, you have Otaman Sherko from the Zaporozhian siege, who said that actually Muscovites are Orthodox Christians and we should not fight them. Instead, he organized groups of Cossacks and they started uh, looting Crimea. This act uh, broke the truth between uh, Hetman Vyhovsky and Tatars. So actually, you know, that was a lose-lose situation. And um, looking deeper in that topic, so Ukraine is prone to exist as a decentralized entity. Because this is the actual the national, the natural modus operandi for this piece of land, which worked in, in history. And the problem, or not the problem, the paradox here is that being decentralized and cherishing that um, democratic freedoms, yes, uh, which Cossacks, for instance, love very much and cherish very much, uh, people or nations or ethnicities living on the territory of Ukraine, they are doomed to, to lose to more centralized powers. So as this happened, for instance, during the Mongol invasion, then there, were most, uh, there was more centralized Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, then there was Russian Empire. So the paradox is that Ukraine is prone to be democratic and decentralized. But having very powerful centralized neighbors, it is also doomed to fall under their influence. Specifically, at least this is what usually happened in history. Uh, 
specifically, um, the danger increases, bearing in mind that Ukraine lacks that experience encoded in collective memory, experience of being a state. Because throughout the history, um, the attempts to create that state were not very successful. Therefore, without that feeling of national um, statehood, feeling of national unity, but at the same time with the proneness to be decentralized and democratized in a bit chaotic way, Ukraine faces very hard times today. And if, for instance, the Western states um, do not take actions, because again, if you look at the history, they were not taking, um, they were not supporting Ukraine very much in the history, throughout the history. So if they also take a neutral uh, stance today, um, Ukraine with time will undergo the influence of a more centralized power. If you think that this is the best solution, the best option to introduce the equilibrium in the Eastern Europe, then you're wrong. Because if you have a centralized authority governing over the entity, the geo geopolitical entity, which is prone to decentralize, so with time, new and new unrests, new and new turbulences will, will pop up. Look again at the history. You have Peter the Great, Emperor, yes, who were, whose best friend was Hetman Mazepa. But Hetman Mazepa, at a certain period, decided that no, we will go against that rule. Uh, and that was not only the one um, attempt to uh, overthrow centralized rule. So Ukraine will be constantly struggling. And you have the, the war for independence in 1921. Then you have uh, this huge, uh, about 5,000 uh, rebellions against communist rule in 1930s. Then you constantly had, even you know, in the harshest times of Soviet Union, you constantly had Ukrainian intellectuals, Ukrainian politicians, who were, I mean, who tried to present themselves as communists and who might have been communists, but they were thinking and caring of Ukraine. So even in the harshest environment of the most, most of the most centralized rule, you have political elites, you have groups of people, you have civic movements who were protesting against that centralized rule. And that would that is what will always happen if any centralized authority is established, specifically foreign centralized authority is established in Ukraine. So what we have right now in Ukraine is, I mean, you, you can you can see that uh, decentralization in action today, because you have oligarchs, you have embedded politicians, you have um, city administration, municipal administrations, you have civic movements, you have grassroots commanders, you have volunteering battalions, so you have a lot of sources of power yes, which actually compete with one another. And that is the natural modus operandi for Ukraine. In this light, if we speak of Ukrainian uh, political symbolism, yes, in this light, you should bear in mind that um, it is constructed as the opposition between two, two poles, the pole of a dweller, a person who is a conformist and would like to adjust to the environment without changing it. For this kind of dweller, yes, um, the, I mean, if you take Russian trade, Russian political symbolism, the dweller accepts this political symbolism. So he or she is fine with a strong leader, with uh, one religion, and one nationality, because that is what allows this person to live a happy life. But on the other hand, you have that the Cossack type activists and the amount of those Cossack type activists who appreciate freedoms and liberties and who are ready to take duties and responsibilities. So the amount of these Cossack type individuals, it grows with time. 
And these Cossack type individuals, they require other leaders. They require Cossack type leaders, actually. People whom they trust, grassroots commanders. Uh, they require leaders whom they can observe and based on what they see, they can trust. They also take care and they pay a lot of attention to the principles of law. There should be a strong legal relations within all the spheres in Ukraine. For dwellers, the law is not that important because the leader stands above the law. For Cossack type individuals, law is very important. And if you look at the Zaporozhian siege, law, it was very strictly regulated, all the interrelations there. So we have the trusted leader, uh, the law, which um, regulates the relations between the leader and the citizens. Uh, and you have uh, the, the pole of faith. And faith for Ukrainians is not ex as exclusive as for Russia. Because in Russia, you have the Russian Orthodox Church, which is not very happy with any competitors emerging within its canonical territory. In Ukraine, you have uh, Russian Orthodox Church, you have Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church, you have Greek Catholic Church, you have Protestant Church, you have Roman Catholic Church. Uh, at certain moments of time, they coexist, compete, or cooperate with one another. And that is also a sign of that open, decentralized nature, open, decentralized modus operandi, which is um, which, which fits Ukrainian way of, of living and Ukrainian political symbolism. And Ukraine does not have that unique feeling of nationality, of two nationalities, Russians have. Because, again, if you look at the Persian siege, there were a lot of people coming from all over Europe. Yes, there is also a theory that uh, General Krivonos, uh, general in the army of Bonovnitsky, that he was of Scottish origin. Yes, Max Campbell. But this is a theory, yes. However, if if even to assume that in the medieval times a person from Scotland would come to, to, to the territory of Ukraine, to Cossack Hetman, and become the general, it means that the environment, the Cossack environment, which provided and still continues to provide uh, the patterns for self governance of Ukraine, so this medieval Cossack environment allowed the person from outside to become the leader the trusted leader the, I mean, to, to take the highest post, authority and legitimacy. And at this moment, I argue that actually Ukraine is a divergent from Russian political symbolic thinking or Ukrainian symbolic thinking diverges from Russian political symbolic thinking as Russian political symbolic thinking is imperialist, while Ukrainian symbolic thinking, thinking is I would say Republican, Republican with democratic flavor, however, not without that affiliation to, to a community. The most recent example of how it works, if you look at the three Ukrainian, recent Ukrainian revolutions, 1990s, 2004, 2014, they all started from the construction of some kind of Zaporozhian siege in the center of Kyiv. So people came together, they um, appointed or they, they cho chose the leaders for them, and they decided to self-organize themselves. So they, they built, they constructed a fortified fortress in Kyiv with uh, their regulations, laws, with uh, internal police, with the in internal medical uh, service and hospitals. So within days, they created a state within a state. And this, this newly created state, it's, it reminded the tradition of the Prozian siege. So people reintroduced, reinstalled the historical uh, experience of self-governance. Uh, they constructed what they found appropriate 
for the local understanding of justice and order. And this is very different from Russia, because again, if you look at the Russian protests, they have different logics. They are not Russians on the protests, they are prone to follow the leader, for instance, Navalny. Yes. While Ukraines on the protests, they can choose leaders at, at the very different moments. So they are not um, tied, for instance, to leaders of opposition. And this is, this is again, what, what differs Ukrainian political symbolic thinking and widely, broadly speaking, Ukrainian political culture from Russia. And this is what I'm writing about in my book. If you look at the key values, and that is also what, for instance, Mr. Alexander Dugin stresses, that it was very decentralized. There was, there was Novgorod, Chernihiv, Kyiv, other cities. Sometimes they were actually fighting with one another. And if you look at, for instance, um, the way Yaroslav the Wise, Prince Yaroslav the Wise, became the, the Prince of Kyiv Rus, it, it, it shows you that he had to defeat all of his brothers to, to, to get to the top. And those brothers, they were supported by other cities and other, other forces. So if you look at the history um, of, of Russian Federation and at the emergence of the Tsardom of Muscovy, it, it had certain, it had other logics, yes. It, these territories, if you look at the zenith of Kyiv, these territories were on the, on the out, outskirts. These were the borderlands of Kyiv, the northern borderlands um, where people lived in a very harsh environment. And usually these were, um, these were the lands with forests, yes, without many plains. So in order to survive in that harsh environment of, of northern Europe, uh, people introduced certain waves of, of governance. And these waves of governance, they were uh, grounded on uh, community values. So individual was not important, decentralization was not important, as this could not guarantee the preservation of the community. So community values were above all. Conservative approach, traditional approach to you know, organizing the life of the community this what mattered. And then you have uh, Mongols coming and Mongol Empire, it was a very centralized empire. Um, history shows that Moscovite Tsars, at least some of them, they were not, they appreciated, let's put it like this, the way Mongols governed over, over their empire. So some of the Mo Mongol administrative traditional solutions you know, in governments, uh, some of these solutions were also introduced for the early Tsardom of Muscovy. So what I'm trying to say here is that being located on the, on the border, on the northeastern border of Kyiv Rus, um, Muscovites, uh, Muscovites, they inherited some flavor from Kievan Rus, some cultural um, heritage, some some visions of justice and order. But because they lived in a very harsh environment, and because they interacted with Mongols, this influence, this created a bit different vision of justice and order. And this also, again, uh, speaking of the point and stressing the point, of living in harsh environment, which shaped Muscovites. And uh, if you look at, for instance, um, the beginning of Cossack times, the beginning of Cossack culture, Cossacks were people who decided to escape centralized rules, to move to the unpopulated steppes, to a very dangerous land, yes, constantly penetrated by hordes of nomads from the east. So they decided to move there and start interaction with those nomads. They decided to face the danger, not to escape the danger in the woods. Yes. 
And this also what makes Ukrainian different, Ukrainians different from, from, from Russians. I mean, from my perspective, there should always be these three um, symbolic pillars. Leadership with hierarchy, Orthodox Church, which reinforces the leadership hierarchy, or the hierarchy of the leader, and uh, Russian nationality, which you know accepts the superiority of, of the leader, even if the leader is wrong, and who follows that principles um, propagate or spread by the Orthodox Church. So you may have your language, you may have your culture, you may have your religion, but you should never question these three symbolic, key symbolic elements. So up to the point when, where you can solve your issues, when you can achieve your objectives without undermining these three pillars, everything is fine. So it, it means that you can have certain amount of governance or self-governance or uh, flexibility within the system of informal practices of bribery or you know, interpersonal relations up to the moment when this starts threatening the ruling, the central ruling hierarchy, then you should stand aside or you should stop doing what you are doing. Because otherwise that would undermine the uh, integrity of the Russian state because it is so big and so diverse. And this triad, this leadership, orthodoxy and uh, nationality, that is what works for Russia in the last century. You may call that conservative setting because, you know, it, this does not encourage to develop, innovate. Yes and no. Because if you look at the development of Russian Empire or Soviet Union, it was quite competitive with the Western states. So it, these, the entities, the states-like entities existing on the territory of Russia uh, throughout the century, they were competitive. But, and this, th this is the moment uh, where I should uh, recall uh, Professor Toynbee, who said, that Russia, in order to be competitive with the West, needs to adopt technologies and ideas invented by the West. West is more open, creative, adventurous. Russia is more conservative because that, that is what works for Russia. However, Russia cannot afford itself to be second, yes, to, to, to fall behind the Western development. Therefore, Russian leaders, and that is where you know the development starts with Russian leaders. When Russian leaders decide to take certain technologies or ideas from the West and implement these ideas and technologies in Russia, this is when Russia modernizes. And you you may have an example of Peter the Great, yes, who was one of the biggest innovator, yes, innovators in the Russian history. Then you have the example of Lenin, Vladimir Ulyanov, who took Marxism, the, the Western idea, and introduced on the territory of Russian Empire. Um, you know, actually replacing the emperor with himself. And later on, you know, Stalin came to take the same role. You have today uh, President Putin, who is also conducting, I would call it, controlled Westernization. So those ideas and technologies are acceptable and those ideas and technologies will be developed by Russian scientists, Russian society, which would reinforce that ruling hierarchy, however, which would also ensure the progress which is needed to be competitive with the West. Uh, as a counter argument, you may have a look at, for instance, genetics. Stalin in 1930s, 1940s declared that genetics is pseudoscience. So Soviet Union never invested into genetics and because of this we have no I mean very developed school of genetics in Russia. At least um, I can't recall any. Uh, if you if you speak from that uh, uh, perspective, if you speak of, of Ukraine on that perspective. 
uh, you have, for instance, Kiev Mohela Academy, one of the earliest um, institutions, educating high level, high profile educating uh, institutions on the territory of Eastern Europe. And uh, that was the place where clergy and political elites were educated. And because the lecturers who worked uh, at uh, Kiel Academy, they, they had European Western background, so they also propagated, for instance, the idea of human rights to, to, to their students. The idea of human rights, which are even today, which is even today uh, being criticized by Russian Orthodox Church. So you have that diversity, um, which may actually even evolve into certain chaos on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, as, as, as you mentioned, actually, that democracy is always in crisis. Yes, it, it is, but it is not a bad thing. So what I did not expect to, to discover um, was, okay, let me begin from, from another perspective, because one of, one, of the per, um, one of the scholars who read my book and provide, provided certain feedback uh, was uh, Professor Andrea Sumland. And he, uh, he let me know that my book is very pro-Ukrainian because I, I at, at a certain moment, it seemed, started, uh, it seemed to him that I'm very pro-Ukrainian. I can't say that I agree, but still, um, the issue is what I discovered and what disappointed me a bit uh, is that because of the, the flavor of democracy, the proneness to decentralize, which Ukraine demonstrates, it will be defeated by more centralized enemies, yes, because it would it would it will take a lot of time for Ukrainians to find a consensus between themselves and to stand against any threat uh, as a one power as a one fist, not you know five fingers separately, and uh, that is that was. Mm, the discovery I did not expect it uh, to find because I believe that finally Ukraine exists as an independent state and let us have a look how things will develop. So, and the discovery was that if uh, things will develop as they go right now with the strengthening of Russian assertiveness, with the development of Russian assertive foreign policy, and with Ukrainian elites failing to find a compromise, um, Ukraine will likely to, un, un, to fall again into the orbit of, of Kremlin. And here um, we should also speak, we should also stress actually, the importance of the Western influence and the Western guidance in Ukrainian democratization. Because throughout the history, the West um, tried to stand aside. It accepted the, the objective that Eastern Europe should be, should reside within the, the Moscow influence, the influence of Moscow. So it did not interfere, in, it, it was not, um, it had no aim to strengthen its position in the Eastern Europe. So right now, after specifically after uh, Euromaidan, uh, the West looks to to change its objectives. The European Union, the United States, Canada. So the le the leaders of these states they look at the situation in Ukraine or, or the crisis in Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, from different perspectives. They are much more serious about this, and this means that with Russia um, suffering from sanctions. And with West getting itself more in war involved into domestic affairs and foreign policy, in, into the Eastern European policies, Ukraine has a chance to undergo a proper transition, a proper democratization, and to establish a stable, decentralized system, which it failed to establish throughout history. And 
which is absent in the collective memory of Ukrainians. So what I argue here is that the Western players should come as mentors and supervisors, which would allow Ukraine to discover itself, to discover its identity, to upgrade its identity, uh, to allow uh, this identity become stable and uh, the interactions between civic groups and political elites, they become coherent and stable. And if the West uh, would again would decide to stand aside, um, Russia would eventually strengthen its influence in the Eastern Europe, strengthen its influence direct or indirect over Ukraine. The book consists of two parts. The first part is about Russian political identity, political culture and uh, political symbolism. The second part is about Ukrainian political culture, political symbols. In the first part, I examined a significant number of sources of facts, and I also read a significant number of researches <clears throat> by other scholars from, from the West, from Russia, because I can read in Russian. And I provided um, an overview as to how these three symbolic constructs, these three decisive symbolic constructs of leadership, orthodoxy, and nationality came to be, how they work, and how they worked in history. And I also um, tried to, to, to predict how they would work in, in future. So I examined, for instance, the, the literary works by Pushkin to define that even actually in the uh, 18th century, these three elements were in place and Pushkin noted them in, in, his, in his words. Uh, in the second part of the book, I examined the Ukrainian, Ukrainian political identity and um, political symbolism. Constructs. I compared them to these three symbolic constructs, which are typical to Russia. And I discovered that Ukrainians uh, they have two poles, not three poles. First pole is the pole of a dweller. First pole is the pole of a dweller. The, the citizens, the symbol of a conformist citizen who would like to enjoy life with having as few troubles as possible. Uh, and this means that this person would like to adjust to any kind of circumstances and in this way to prevent any kind of complications in his or her life. And the other symbolic pole is the pole of Kozak, the person who would, who will constantly challenge the traditional arrangements, uh, regardless whether this is the post-Soviet identity or even expansionism of Western values, uh, the Kozak who would try to, who would aim to discover the indigenous um, identity, the indigenous patterns of behavior for Ukraine. Yes, and this Cossack requires different leader, different um, faith, diff he, he or she has a diff very different view on faith than the dweller. And this Cossack has also cherishes different perception of what is to be a proper citizen. So Cossacks, in the respect in the respect to citizenship, they appreciate liberties, freedoms, but they also are ready to take duties and responsibilities, which is not the case for for the dweller. Yes, who would like to 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 have um, you know we say it in Ukraine So you know he would like to live somewhere in the very cozy place with no one disturbing him or her. That is what I what I discovered. Thank you for inviting me.